Hey, dickheads! We have a special pink laser beam of truth in our Dick Adjacent series on the Hugo Award-winning novels of the 60s. But today, we're, we, today we are specifically talking about Waystation by Clifford Samak. Now, our special guest talking about this book with me is my friend Matthew Whitaker. Now, the reason why I invited Matt is because many years ago, and we'll get into this in a little bit, he was the first person to tell me, hey, you should really read Clifford Samak. I had never heard of the guy before, before Matt introduced him to me. Matt, uh, give the folks a little bit of your background. First, um, maybe how you got into science fiction, and then we'll talk about how we met each other. Oh, man. Well, uh, science fiction is just always been what I gravitated toward reading if it wasn't weird stuff like philosophy, but, you know, speculative fiction and Philip K. Dick included, of course, uh, just always, you know, right there. I mean, it's just what made sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, now we met each other because you used to be have one of those coveted jobs back in the day where you actually worked in the cool record store in town at Karma Records in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, my hometown. And I used to go in there to buy seven inch records and um, I would talk to you about punk and metal and all those things. And then uh, somewhere along the way, we realized that we both like science fiction. And I don't remember exactly how it started, but that's how uh, you introduced me to Clifford Samack. Now, uh, People might know some of your work, especially in the Midwest, uh, for you're a musician and you played in a seminal band from my hometown, the Belgian Waffles, who were like a weird avant-garde noise band. Can you tell the people a little bit about what the Belgian Waffles were and then we'll get into Clifford Samak? Uh, yeah, we get, we get together in Bloomington in 1986 and... Uh, me and my friend Tony, I'm sure you remember Tony, and Bill, who initially worked at Karma. Uh, Bill still lives here in Louisville. Tony's out in Tucson, Arizona now. Um, but we all had just kind of a similar headspace with being dissatisfied with regular music and wanting to kind of stretch things out. And nothing was really harsh enough for our taste, and we were discovering free jazz at the time and just kind of ran it all together in a train wreck, and that sounded really good to us. Uh, uh, other people, not so much, but... <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to give a shout-out to the Belgian Waffles because uh, you guys were pretty amazing. And um, it, it would be, to, I think the way I would describe it to somebody who's not familiar, it would be like the musical equivalent of David Lynch's weirdest moments, maybe, um, on film. We'll take that. We'll take that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really good stuff. And at different times, you guys had a horn section and um, just all kinds of different things. And you guys were just doing really cool stuff. So um, that's part. And I mentioned that because uh, I trusted you to when you told me like, oh, here's this weird, cool stuff you should be reading. I, I listened to you partially because. I knew you knew weird, cool stuff very well. So sure. how did you uh, personally discover Clifford Samak? Well, um, at the time, Tony and I got the band together. Tony is an avid science fiction reader and writer as well. Uh, you know, we were playing, um, you know, role-playing. What, what was the Gamma World? We were playing Gamma World along with our D and D, and you know Tony wrote that campaign, and so he and I were sharing our different uh, influences, the stuff we liked, and um, you know a lot of it dug back into that you know pre moonshot kind of real hacky stuff, which we always really enjoyed. Um, that kind of kind of like film noir only in you know sci fi version almost, and uh, Tomac was one of those. Like, he was kind of in that older, you know, like, I mean, he do start writing in the 30s, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We'll get into that. And um, <laughs> we traded those, like, you know, like like Samuel Delaney, we discovered him around at the same time. Um, I actually got, had hit some classes that involved uh, American Studies, which had some sci-fi in it at the time, so that was cool. Yeah. Well, um, 
when you first suggested some act to me, uh, I read, I think the first one was Cemetery World was my first one, my introduction. And what's kind of interesting and cool about this episode is that we both read a bunch of Samak's work, but we neither one of us had read Waystation before doing right preparing for this podcast, which is cool. Um, which is interesting. Um, I'm not sure which ones you've read, but I've read uh, Cemetery World, Ring Around the Sun, City, of course, which is his masterpiece. Oops, sorry. Time and again, I think I've read, and other than that, that's I think that's the sum total of the main ones I've read. Time is the simplest thing I think I've read, and then I, uh, lots of short stories. I'm not sure if you remember which titles you've read, just for context. Yeah, well, when, when you you know you got this ball rolling, I I kind of started going through you know some of the titles that I had sitting around the library, and the Goblin Reservation. I remember had that one. And one of his, you know, I think it was maybe novella, but it was, you know, uh, printed, it was called Trouble for Tycho. Uh, that one was pretty, that was a real kind of dry, sort of noir moon mining kind of <laughs> take on. But there are a couple others, but. All right. So let's get into who Clever Smack was. Um, he was born August 3rd, 1904. At 1904, right? Uh, and he died April 25th, 1988. So he was born in 1904 and died in a year when the Cro-Mags released a record. So he had a pretty good run. Um, he won three Hugo Awards and one Nebula. He was the Science Fiction Writers of America made him the third ever Grand Master. So he was, he, I mean, that's pretty high honor to be the third person picked to be uh, the Sifwa Grand Master. He was also um, the Horror Writers Association, the HWA, made him one of their three inaugural winners of the Bram Stoker Award for Lifetime Achievement. And I believe at the time the president was Robert McCammon who is one of my favorite writers. So I think, and uh, the presidents of the HWA have a lot to do with who gets chosen for the Lifetime Achievement just because of the way that they work. And so I thought that was really cool that um, right off the bat, I never really thought of him as a horror writer, so it's kind of cool that he won a Stoker for um, Lifetime Achievement in horror. But I think a lot of that has to do with a lot of his short story output because he had a lot of stories in uh, Weird Tales in the early days, in the 30s. So I think they might have been trying to honor a lot of those writers, and he was still alive when um, he got that uh, notoriety from the HWA. But his first major award was the International Fantasy Award for Best Fiction in 1953, for City. Have you read City, Matt? Or is that one you have... Have you read that one? If, if I did, I, I don't have it anymore. Yeah. City is so, the... It's been a while. <laughs> City is the one that is... Um, uh, it takes place in a future where, the, where intelligent dogs and robots are kind of telling each other stories about back in the day when humans were around. Um, I don't know if you remember that concept. That sounds familiar, yeah. Yeah. Um, I recently reread City. I read City very early on after you first introduced me to him, but I reread it maybe 10 years ago, and uh, City is incredible. Um, it's, uh, I personally think it's his masterpiece, and I think many would agree. Oh, yeah, we've got a copy of it right here. So... Um, yeah, this one right here. Uh, and uh, one of the major highlights of modern science fiction says the New York Herald Tribune. Um, I really dug this one, and I think it's one that stands up the best and is a really great example of 50s science fiction. Um, another reason why Samak might work for you and I is he's a Midwestern writer. And um, I don't know if I mean, did you get that sense reading him back in the day? Did you feel the Midwest in him? 
I, I guess so. It, it wasn't conscious, but I think in the sense that, like, yeah, <laughs> it, it, makes, it makes sense. It makes sense. Like I said, it, it wasn't a conscious thing, but, you know, it's, you're used to that sort of stuff. But it, it, it still seems a little austere. It's almost a little more out of time, like this, his sort of, mm-hmm. like his conventions, you know. Right, but I guess, I guess they would make sense to a Rust Belt kind of sensibility. You know? Well, he was born in Wisconsin, Millville, Wisconsin, son of Lewis and Margaret Wiseman Samak. Is our um, Wiseman was his mom's maiden name. Samak attended the University of Wisconsin Madison and then taught in public schools until the thirties when he started when he moved to Minneapolis, to the big city, and became a reporter first and then an editor of the Minneapolis Star and Tribune. And he worked there until he retired in 1976. And he was eventually, he he was made the news editor in 1949. So he was very, very involved in that paper in a very serious way. And I think his time as a newspaper man, um, I don't know if it really bleeds through in there um, so much as I think his uh, West, Midwestern upbringing to me is in, if you look at, for example, Way Station is a book that takes place in a rural area with, you know, uh, characters who are kind of like more everyday people. But his first, his first publication was a story called World of the Red Sun, and that was published in December 1931 in an issue of Wonder Stories edited by Hugo Gernsback, the guy that the Hugos were uh, named for. And he published stories with Gernsback's magazines from 1950 all the way to 1986, long after um, Gernsback, of course, had passed on, but, you know, kept up with some of those major um, publications. Over 100 of his short stories were published from 1931 to 1981, and he wrote in science fiction, western, and war genres. Now, he wrote in western and war genres basically to make money. (laughs) Um, And there are quotes out there where you can see where he says that science fiction was his love and his passion, and he wrote those. I've never read any of his westerns or war, you know, shoot them ups I don't know if you have... I mean, this this one to me kind of plays into that. I, I can see it. I I can, of course. I mean, it you know it goes back to the Civil War with the character, but um, you know, I, I can see that flavor, Western factor. Yeah. You know, there's no cowboys, but <laughs> right. But there is the way station kind of reminded me of like the idea of it. Kind of reminds you of that uh, train station in the middle of the desert that people would kind of have to stop off at. Yeah, yeah. And it almost has this sort of ascetic Grapes of Wrath quality to it, too, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll get more into the book here soon, but on being remembered, there's I found a quote that Samak uh, had from an interview in 1980 where he said, I would hope in science fiction circles 100 years from now, once a year or so, somebody will say, there was a man by the name of Clifford Samack. I can't be sure that will happen. I'm not too upset that it may not, but I think that myself, Heinlein, Silverberg, Asimov, Dixon, and quite a few others that I could name that have been the pace setters who will determine for a time the direction of science fiction will take. Our influence will not be overwhelming but we are the men who blazed the trail, and that gives me awfully good feeling to think about that. And what's interesting, too, is that um, I also, I saw an interview online. I couldn't find it on YouTube. It was on, um, I think it was on some Facebook group, but it was uh, the University of Kansas did a series of interviews in the 70s with different science fiction writers, and there was one with some Mac. And he he, said, he talked about how in the 30s he got a letter from a teenage, teenage Isaac Asimov uh, where Asimov was actually complaining about the ending of one of his stories. Um, and they began a correspondence. So 
uh, Asimov is, you know, you know, a lot of Asimov's career is given credit to John W. Campbell because Asimov spent a lot of time going to Campbell's office to, you know, because they were both in New York City. But Asimov has also given a lot of credit to the letters that he exchanged with Isaac Asimov, which I didn't know before I watched this video that they knew each other or that they traded letters. But the fact that a teenage Isaac Asimov was writing to, at the time, uh, um, you know, news or beat reporter Clifford Samack in, in Minneapolis is pretty cool to think about. But. <sighs> Am I remembering, wasn't it like one of his sports stories that he was complaining about? <laughs> it had something to do with sports? I don't remember what it was specifically about, but I remember Samak basically told him, reread it in a couple years and you'll, you'll get it. Or he made some kind of comment that Asimov, like, it was like a eureka moment for Asimov that after the letter... He understood what Samak was trying to do with the story. I wish I, I should have gone back and watched the video because I, I don't remember. But uh, but it was it was it was a cool thing to to read about. And I think that story might be an astounding the um, the biography about um, John W. Campbell and Astounding Magazine. But uh, but I'm not I'm not entirely certain. But. Uh, um, it's really cool to think about those two uh, communicating. I don't know how you feel about that, Matt, but I, I just think that's... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, before we get uh, heavily into the book, the last thing that we have to talk about is that this book was released in 1963, but it was originally, uh, as most science fiction novels were at the time, it was serialized through magazines. Um, and that was kind of common practice then. Most novels did not, most science fiction novels could not get a straight, uh, paperback, uh, publisher until they at least kind of got word of mouth out through being in these magazines. And originally, Waystation was called Here Gather the Stars, and it appeared in Galaxy Magazine between June and August 1963. Although, I believe he greatly expanded the text once he turned it into a novel. And after it was published in Galaxy, it was, that's, it was only published in Galaxy when it was nominated for the Hugo. It, um, and the books that were, it was up against, the other nominees were Glory Road by Robert A. Heinlein. What a lightweight, huh? <laughs> Witch World by Andrew Norton. Another no-name writer, right? Uh, I'm, of course, being sarcastic. Dune World by Frank Herbert, which was the first three months that Dune was published in the analog. And uh, Cat's Cradle by Hoosier author Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, and the Toastmaster that year was editor Tony Boucher. Shout out to Tony. Um, as we often talk about him on this podcast. But it's a very stacked category that year. All the names are major names in science fiction. Clifford Samack, Robert Heinlein, Andre Norton, Frank Herbert, and of course, a titan of publishing in Kurt Vonnegut. So it's a really heavy category. I mean, I mean, what do you think, Matt, about this, this category as a whole this year? Well, yeah, that's, that's pretty deep. <laughs> that's pretty deep of course you know I mean, there's different you know phases of what's going on there but but yeah that that's pretty mm -hmm. stiff competition right and uh in any given year uh highland of course had already won in the 60s for starship troopers and i believe he would go on uh the next year to re or next or two years after that would win for stranger in a strange land so he's already a titan. Frank Herbert was kind of new on the scene, and nobody really knew what was going on with. But obviously, Dune is a very powerful piece of work, and it would go on to win the Hugo when it became a complete novel. And what you have here is basically the first act of the finished novel in uh, novella form with Dune World. And But for me, it's just impossible to believe that there is any book better in this year 
than Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. And that's where you get into a real controversial thing because, uh, you know, Way Station 1, and it's a great, and I'm, you know, spoiler alert, I really liked it. <laughs> but uh, the fact of the matter is that Cat's Cradle is an absolutely incredible work by Kurt Vonnegut. Have you read Cat's Cradle? I, I looked at some of it when we got into this, and I, I think I had read a bit of it, but I'm a, I'm a big Pinchon fan, and I even like, you know, Catch-22, Hello, Catch-22, and um, it, it always seemed like if you took the Ice-9 factor away, that you would have more speculative fiction with Cat's Cradle, um, but yeah, I mean, just in, in terms of, it's the one that's known now. You know, I mean, it, it, it's held its own. It's that sort of like when Metallica lost the Grammy to Jethro Tull, you know. <laughs> I don't want to compare Waystation to Jethro Tull, but... Um, I've seen three articles uh, about Waystation winning that have referenced Jethro Tull and Metallica, so you're not alone in that observation. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, because I think Cat's Cradle, well not as purely science fiction maybe as Slaughterhouse-Five was. Um, it's just an incredible piece of work. Um, I think Cat's Cradle personally is, is I, I think, I know a lot of people will say Slaughterhouse-Five, but I personally think Cat's Cradle is Vonnegut's best, especially of that era. Um, and so for me, like, immediately when I saw that it beat Cat's Cradle, it was, it was kind of hard for me to believe. Now, we, now we should talk about there is politics involved in, in this. And, we recent, and for those of you who have um, listened to our Norman Spinrad interview, you'll know that he talked about the fact that when he was the CIFWA president, the Science Fiction Writers Association, he wanted to give a Lifetime Achievement Award to Kurt Vonnegut for um, a science fiction grandmaster and Vonnegut respectfully called him and told him like, I, I don't want it, <laughs> uh, which, you know, we can debate whether that's cool or not cool. Um, but he had worked so hard to get himself out of what he considered to be the science fiction ghetto that he didn't even want the Science Fiction Grandmaster Award, and I think the voters of the Hugo were probably thinking, well, Vonnegut's not even going to show up anyways, and I think that there was a degree that n not only was Samak guaranteed to show up, but he also, I think, was getting somewhat of a Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah, I mean, more of a, a father of the form, as it said at the time. And I think Vonnegut was, yeah, I made some stuff up about this water ice nine thing, but it's just a weird novel, you know, and uh, trying to, you know, keep that from being, you know, a con convention, genre convention. Which, and, and it's almost, you know, it's undeniable, it's more undeniable that Slaughterhouse-Five is science fiction, because you have time travel and aliens and and what's going on, and, and, and Cat's Cradle is more just kind of, like, speculative flourishes, right? Yeah, well, and like I said, it, it reminds me a lot of V by the Thomas Pinchon, because it kind of has the same same sort of characterizations, and, you know, I, I've read some stuff that talks about, you know, the Joseph Heller being in there, too, that sort of, at, at that time, like the early 60s, that was you know, a, a wave of things that were coming out, like uh, like V. And you could argue that there's not really any science fiction in, in Pinchon either, but, you know, it, it's closely related. Yeah, and I'm always one for expanding the definition of these genres instead of yeah. narrowing them. I can't yeah. stand when people look at... Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a running thing that people can see if they follow me on Facebook is uh, me having to argue with people who say movies like, for example, It Comes at Night. People will say, it's not a horror movie. What? That is absolutely a horror movie. Uh, the Mechanic with Christian Bale is absolutely a horror movie, right? And I think with science fiction, I'm kind of the same way. Like, uh, I know you could kind of, 
sci-fi and speculative and 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 weird and surreal. You can get into all these different things, dystopia, all these different things. But as a basic umbrella of genre fiction, whether you want to call it speculative or sci-fi, I say expand the definition. No, I, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's modalities of thought, as far as I'm concerned, like things that make me think in a certain way, hold, you know, hold that focus. And that's kind of what I was talking about when you asked me earlier, how did I get into science fiction? I think it just made me think in a certain way. And, and then it, yeah, it, it bleeds out beyond the genre convention into other forms. Right. Yeah, um, yeah and what's cool is because w- by doing this series, I'm kind of getting a look at, you know, all these novels that were considered the best of the 60s and, and getting a real feel for the genre in the decade. But specifically with all the work that we're doing going through all the PKD books, you know, um, and when we're talking about the Toastmaster for this particular Hugo is Tony Boucher. Um, just the amount of influence that I've learned that this guy, Tony Boucher, had on the genre whose name I had never heard of before doing this podcast uh, is just absolutely amazing, you know, what, what an influence this guy had. And apparently he's the one that handed the Hugo to Clifford Samack this year uh, in 1964. So, Way Station won some other awards. Um, and it was placed 27th in the 1966 Astounding slash Analog All-Time Poll. So, 1966, of all the science fiction novels that had been written through 1966, it came in 27th. Um, they did the same list in 1987, and it actually went up to the 25th spot, where it was tied with Rendezvous with Rama by Arthur C. Clarke another banger, um, and um, it also placed 31st in the 1998 poll, so the three times that th- this all-time poll was done through 1998, it, it placed not just in the poll, but high, because they were doing one through 100, right? So it stayed around, so 31st was the lowest it got in those polls, hmm. and so people... Uh, really appreciate this book. So the only quote I could find, because one of the things we try to do with PKD is we try to find quotes about the writing of it. And I only found one quote where Samak appeared to be talking about Way Station in 1980, but he also get, this could also be taken generally, but he was asked a question about Way Station, and he said, I write about ordinary people, and most of the people who read my work are ordinary people. I'm disinclined to think that if there were to be aliens, an alien to come to Earth, he would seek out a professional. He would probably make an effort to talk to someone that is a typical representative of our race. I think that a breakthrough or something like a first meeting with aliens is more dramatic if it's made by an ordinary man. Forget the sexist language for a little bit. <laughs> he was born in 1904. Uh, because... Um, because if a specialist... Yeah, we'll get to that later. Yeah. Because if a specialist made it, he would, be, he would not be excited about it. He would probably go into a long detail of tests, wondering about and trying to figure out logically, while an ordinary person would react as you and I would react. It's far more effective. I'm against heroes anyhow. I rate hero, um, how I rate heroes. They make the rest of us look so damn bad. Uh, a man is o- a man who is always successful makes all the rest of us look terrible. <laughs> this is kind of a funny quote. Um, so yeah, so now let's get into uh, the actual story of Waystation. So uh, Waystation is a book that is about a man named Enoch who is a veteran of the American Civil War, and his neighbors think he's kind of weird because <laughs> yeah. He, every once in a while, comes and sit out, sits on his porch like everybody else, but he never seems to age. And if all the records are to believe, he should be like, what, 112 or something years old? And what we later discover is the reason why... 125, something like that. Yeah. The reason why he has not aged is because the only time he's aging is when he is outside of his house, because his house is a 
portal slash uh, um, vortex out of time. And so once you go inside his house or you go through uh, inside his house, time uh, moves at a different speed um, because he is a traveling post. So the idea is, is that you have these like galaxy spanning transporters where different civilizations from around the galaxy, they walk through a portal and they come out on another planet and before, but they have a range limit. So you have to go, you have to hop from one planet to the other. And usually you spend the evening, you know, I guess maybe you have to kind of get your bearings set before you jump back in and um, go to the next planet. So what, like a train station, you know. Yeah, kind of like yeah, a layover at an airport or a train station. And what's cool about Enoch is he's this guy who, in um, during right after the Civil War, he's coming home and he meets this guy who he names Ulysses. And Ulysses is uh, what he later learns is an alien. I got the impression that he kind of looked human, <laughs> um, but he explains. In a really cool scene, he explains, like, there's this big and wider universe, and, hey, would you want to be a part of it? And we're looking for this spot for this way station, and could you be this representative? And that's kind of the start of it. Now, um, we're going to assume at this point that if you've made it this far, you have either read the book already or don't give a shit about spoilers because we're going to spoil it. I know some people are going to listen to these episodes so we can read it for you, <laughs> right, and be your cliff notes. So at this point, we're going into full-on spoilers uh, for what happens for the rest of the book. Um, and so... Matt, uh, your overall impressions of this book, first as a purely work of science fiction and then as a work of Clifford Zemeck. My impressions, wow. Well, I mean, it, it, it's pretty, you know, genre-defining in some way. And the, the stuff you just read, the quote from him, talking about normal people, you know, it was a very sparse and self-contained character and and a lot of the book lived inside well the whole the whole book lived inside enoch's head and um there weren't very many characters like it, it was very there was a lot of space even though it was also confined to his house which is the way station in a lot of ways and, and he couldn't ever go very far away from that but it just there was a lot of air in the room, you know, there was a lot of air outside when, and when he would take his walks and stuff. Um, I mean, it, it fit in that sense of old school, you know, it seemed like he was maybe a reporter at some time and wrote in the thirties, even though this was in, done in the sixties, of course, but it had that kind of, you know, sparse old school quality to it. And I think, you know, that's something that maybe placed it at, you know, the award-winning position. I mean, it, it was pretty um, spare. It's like if you can make a good song out of three chords, same three chords that everybody plays, but it sounds new and different and everybody likes it, and you've really done something. And uh, I think maybe that's kind of what, uh, what this had going for it. Yeah, and I think that you make a great analogy about uh, the power chord, because, um, you know, Rudy Rucker is a science fiction writer who always talks about science fiction power chords. And, like, he'll always say, um, you know, that UFOs or um, time travel or whatever are, are, are the power chords, and how you structure a song around them is, is what makes a science fiction novel work. And what I think was neat for this book was that it became such a great vessel for philosophical ideas uh, because you have this great... One of the things that was so cool is that Enoch is such a great character and his door or window onto the universe uh, represents the reader so well because you get an idea of, of he, he has not lost the wonder. And in fact... 
I have a quote, and it's, um, and I have from the library, from the San Diego library, I got the first edition hardcover <laughs> um, that, yeah, and I was the first person to check it out in like 15 years. <laughs> um, which I, I don't know if I'm happy about that, but uh, yeah, that is this, you know, it's the second time that's happened in this series when I got The Wanderer by Fritz Lieber. It hadn't been checked out since 1988. Um, <laughs> but uh, I really loved this on page 33 of the first edition. Our horizons are so far, he thought. We see so little of them. Even now, with the flaming rockets striving from Canaveral to break the ancient bonds, we dream so little of them. The ache was there. The ache had been growing. The ache to tell all mankind those things that he had learned. Not so much specific things, although there were some of that that mankind well could use, but general things, the unspecific central fact that there was intelligence throughout the universe, that man was not alone, that if only he found the way he needed to never be alone again. I love that passage. Um, and that's like a really good example of, of how he uses Enoch as a character to um, be a window on this, you know, vision that he had of the universe. So go ahead, Matt. Oh no! I was just gonna say. I mean, there's there's a lot going on there, and with, with you know, back to the three chord thing, it, it's that that simple structure that leaves a lot of of air. Like I said, and and he uh, there's a lot of duality going on throughout this story. Uh, you know, it, it it occurred to me pretty early on that the Earth to Enoch and it was like, was like a body and his house, the way station itself was like the mind because that was infinite. When he was in his house, he was in touch with an infinite universe that he could only imagine, but he was, was a part of, you know, it just went on forever. But when he, when he went outside to go get the mail, you know, which was his only thing that he would go outside once a day to do, and the postal worker was the only friend he had. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and a, a friend because he left him alone. You know, <laughs> he left him alone. That was that was the key. But but you know, when he was out in the world, he loved the world too. I mean, he saw the beauty in it. And um, you know, there's a little back and forth w with him in terms of who am I, what am I loyal to? Am I loyal to the world that, that I'm from? Am I loyal to my body or do I continue my spiritual journey into my mind and um, being the way station and uh, play that out further? You know? Yeah. And you know, what's cool is this book does have a real fifties feel to it. And I think, you know, I haven't read choice of the gods, but I've been told that that's, the one that where Samak was trying to like catch up to the new wave in the sixties and to do something like kind of more, you know, heavy metal, <laughs> you know, uh, for that time. And I, I do intend to read it soon, but I, I like that this book has an old school feel to it. Like it feels more old school than, you know, if, if we look at, you know, this one, one year after man in the high castle, right. Okay. And so a lot of people talk about how um, Waystation winning was almost, you know, PKD winning was like, hey, the hot new kids are starting to take over and here comes the new wave. And then it was kind of like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, we're, we're still honoring the old school, right? And, um, but I think that the feeling of this book, I don't know if you, I just, it, felt like older sci-fi yeah absolutely yeah that, that's that's what i mean it, you you could tell that he'd been writing that long and and just the yeah the, the flavor of it and and even enoch as a character i mean he's very you just get that sense of he's like kind of square jawed and sort of like a i don't know sort of andy griffith kind of character you know <laughs> um 
for lack of a better analogy. But um, who is who's the who's the guy that did all the murals at IU? You know what I'm talking about? The big two dimensional mural, you know, that kind of square jawed guy with a shovel. You know? Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but. Um... Uh, at you, uh, Indiana University, for those who are not from our area. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, it does have this kind of old uh, feel to it. But So one of the, um, the next things that happens in the story that kind of propels the story forward is that, you know, there's all these kinds of neat scenes where Enoch just kind of, like, chills out at the house, hanging out with the travelers that come through. And then there's, there's one... So you get this really good picture of this wide and vast universe. You get this idea that the universe is teeming with life in, in, in this world that Samak has created. And you have the hazers, and you have, um, you know, the math whizzes are from Mizar. But um, what was really particularly funny for me as somebody who's a 27-year-long uh, uh, vegan... I cracked up when I read that. Yeah, a big part of the story is that there are these travelers that have come from Vega, which, um, and one of them dies. And so every reference to, there's constant references to the vegan language, or vegan, I, I just can't say vegan, I have to say vegan just because I'm trained that way. Um, but it says here, for example, on page 91, they helped him learn the vegan language and had brought him scrolls of vegan literature and many other things. So you get the idea that, first of all, one thing that's, that that tells you is that Enoch is learning a lot from these cultures. He's taking time to educate himself. And so he's not just some old man who's or, or like Civil War veteran at this point. He is a very knowledgeable person about the galaxy. But what happens with these vegans is that uh, one of them happens to die on Earth. And I, I can't remember how that happened, actually. It's, it's spacing my mind right now. But he was with chilling, like sleeping on the couch or something. <laughs> yeah. And he just like nods off and he, he dies. But so they have these really intense customs about um, death and burial, or, or they have to be put to the customs of whatever the local world is, I think. Right. Yeah, but there's part of it that's their custom. So he buries um, the uh, vegan. Yeah, their custom is like no custom because they belong anywhere, essentially. Right. Yeah. But this becomes a big thing because, and I forgot, there, um, one thing that, was kind of a negative in the writing is that in the first chapter there's a really cool scene where a character is introduced as kind of being like a spy who's watching Enoch who's trying to figure out the mystery of where this guy came from and how he's so old and I do think it's a weakness of the writing that he that character kind of drops off for like a huge part of the novel and you kind of forget about him yeah, I have I have a reason why I, uh, related that why I'm I'm a li was a little disappointed in that too. So yeah, well we'll get to that in a second. But this is a major plot point because this is the reason why they they are we Enoch does not know really that they're watching him, but they come and steal the body of this alien and take it to Washington to be poked and prodded, and this sets off a diplomatic crisis with um, the vegans who um, apparently want to destroy Earth <laughs> because, like, they are so offended or, or, they, or they want to um, take Enoch from his job. Yeah, you'll get fired. Uh, I read it as basically like you get fired and you don't get to be part of the galactic map. Like, your way station will be closed and... Yeah, you're you're not you're not part of the fraternity as it was called, which is a big problem for Enoch because yeah. he's really worried about nuclear weapons, as anyone in 1963 would be, right? Mm -hmm. And so, a huge part of this book is this idea that Enoch is very concerned about the Earth uh, joining the fraternity of worlds, so they can be saved from themselves and nuclear weapons, which is 
one of the cool things, or one of the reasons why, I, I, you know, I have no idea. I don't remember other than the fact that you were the one that told me to read some act. I can't remember. I know it was at Karma, right, that we were at the record store, and you told me about him. And I remember I walked right to Caveat Emptor and bought um, City, uh, Cemetery World. Like, literally, I walked from your store to that store, <laughs> right? And... Um, and uh, what I liked about Clifford Samack is that it was obvious that he was a very thoughtful guy who had opinions, and he wanted his science fiction to be a positive force and make change. And Waystation is very much part of that, because this whole idea of Enoch wanting uh, very badly to get human beings into the fraternity of worlds is, is you know, that is the theme of the book. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the part of the issue is that, you know, Earth, by all the other uh, races and, and, and planets and galaxies, it is seen as kind of a backwash, you know, kind of a backwater place. And it's like, can humanity, you know, Enoch's questioning whether or not humanity can live up to, you know, being a part of the larger universe. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you know he doesn't even yeah that's a, that he does some deep thinking about that right and and even though he he has a um a chance at one point uh you know even though he's very worried about this and he wants to see humanity grow up and mature and do better when he's given the shot when they're like hey you can represent earth for the whole council he's like whoa that's a little heavy <laughs> right <laughs> um I don't know if I'd be a good representative to represent Earth. And then, um, you know, because they say to him, as a representative of Earth, you can appear before the Galactic Central and appeal for us to use it. As a member of your race, you could give testimony and you will be given a hearing. If there seems to be merit in your plea, Central might name a group to investigate and thereupon, uh, and then upon the report of its findings, a decision could be made. And you said I for for everyone on Earth, anyone who anyone who could gain a hearing. So basically, one thing that's interesting is that anybody could represent their planet, uh, according to this scene. That anybody could be like, hey, um, I want to represent Mizar Four. Um, here, I'm I'm a long-standing citizen of Mizar Four, so like you know, put me up there. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, he he was chosen for the role, but but the reasons for that were pretty simple, like him being alone and isolated, and and, and I have to assume open minded. I I don't know how Ulysses would have gotten to spy on him to, you know, make sure he was open minded enough, but you know, clearly he was. Yeah, there is a scene. I don't have that one dog-eared where. Um where he and Ulysses first talk about, um, I think they're eating a meal, and Ulysses suggests to him, hey, what if there's, what What would you think about it if there was like this big world above the sky, basically? And so, you know, U Ulysses obviously saw something in Eoc. Um And I didn't really get the idea, I got the impression that Ulysses was sent there to be like, hey, find somebody who can man, who can, man person <laughs> who can run this way station yeah and uh you know enoch was the person that he chose so um and i, I didn't mean to gender ulysses because i really don't know but uh uh nonetheless um uh, that sets up the whole thing at the end basically where you the story comes down to whether humanity is, um, you know, ready for this responsibility. And, um, you know, and then we, you know, Enoch has to make some decisions. <laughs> Enter the one female. Right. <laughs> Which is a huge problem with science fiction in this era. Um, we just... Uh, released our episode on clans of the Alphane Moon and the you know the representation of women in that book. Even though you know we love Philip K. Dick here, but the representation of women in that book is is pretty poor. And um, you know, one way I was you know we obviously talk in this podcast we often talk about how would we adapt this or modernize something. And um, 
I thought it would be kind of cool way to modernize this is if um, e I don't know it might take away the power of Enoch being a lone loner but I kind of thought maybe it might be interesting if it was Enoch and a, and a wife you know that had this responsibility because it yeah. That was the that was the weird thing about the the created images that he hung out with and fell in love with Mary, you know, at the beginning. That that was one of the parts that I kind of had a, a little harder time with. It was almost like I'm going to throw this little chunk of stuff in here, and it's going to be it's going to kind of keep me along the lines of the myth of the Western self made man or something. You know, it it, it sort of didn't didn't jive, but. Um, I mean, there are really only six characters in the book, and, and right, one of them's Lucy. But yeah, who's a simulacra? I think I didn't even really understand. Like Mary. Yeah, I didn't even understand if she came. If she was a part of the mechanics of the way station to keep him company. That's what I thought it was. At yeah. Time. Yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, and so, but I wasn't even entirely sure, and I definitely thought that was one of the weaker parts of the uh, of the story. Yeah, because the end it, it felt kind of forced at the end, but I don't I don't want to get in the way of the linear. Wait, you're going here? Well, no, 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 no. I mean, I'm kind of getting towards the end, but um, but and then there's also a subplot with the with the redneck lynch mob, um, and then there's this weird kind of sub story where. There's a neighborhood kid who's being abused by their parents because they're disabled, right? Um, at least, at least deaf or deaf, or at least mute. We don't know that she's deaf. We assume she, he says she is. Um, so yeah, maybe some kind of, you know, mm -hmm. on a spectrum of some sort, <laughs> right? And this storyline is a little kind of left field. And but what it what it does is um, kind of sets up Enoch for it, it's mostly I think that part of the story is there to to put unwanted attention on Enoch, you know, and force him to do something. I think it's supposed to be an analogy that he's doing this thing for this abused young child. Um, it's supposed to give an idea of a sense of justice. It's supposed to be a parallel to the decisions he's making on a galactic scale, right? He, he you know, yeah, he stands up for her mm -hmm. to, to her family, and I think that, I mean, you know, yeah, it, it speaks to his his virtue and sense of what's right, mm -hmm. and the fact, like when she later comes into the way station, that's part of protecting her. And, you know, that kind of sets up how it plays out in the end, right? Right, right. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, there's a whole part of the story about the, the talisman that he's kind of given. And that, I, I don't know, that kind of worked for me, but I also kind of thought it was a little, a little superfluous because I think the m most important thing is that it's his decision of whether to represent humanity and to continue to work, or does he want to continue to be a part of the way station? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, that struck me that that did work, that I think he was trying to do, was a, a lot of macro, micro removals. That, like you said, being the macro question, I'm representing the, our entire world to the entire universe. And then micro is like, you know, what was just in her head and how she could make the balls spin on that one foreign toy that he had, you know? Um, like, there were micro moments, and, like, like you know, he'd go into the way station, and he could expand his mind to the entire universe, and then he goes outside to get the mail, and there's a flower. Yeah. I think there was a lot of interplay with the macro-micro thing, and, and I think I think he, he worked that well most of the time. Yeah. I th and and um, how did you feel? Well, I guess you kind of you kind of brought this up because you're bringing up some like kind of the intricacies of the prose, and I don't mm -hmm. think Samak is, you know, he's kind of known as an idea guy, and he's not known, you know, because a lot of science fiction at this era is known as being idea fiction, and not really known for the characterization or the style of the prose. However, 
I think those are both things that this book has really is really done well. I think the characters, as few as they are, but especially Enoch, uh, definitely not Lucy, but Enoch is a very well written character. I have very good idea for who he is, and it's a character that I really enjoyed spending the pages with, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you do get a lot of insight because it is the majority of it is is very much inside of his head, even more than a lot of first person narrative is. Yeah, and it's not a first person narrative. It's 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 not at all. But but it, I I think your point is valid because uh, in the sense that. It, you do spend, I mean, you, this is Enoch's story completely and you're, you're definitely in it with him. But I also think that the prose, especially like, for example, that first uh, part that I read where he's talking about uh, the earth, about wanting to be able to tell the whole earth. That's actually a really beautiful passage. Um, and, it, and throughout, uh, you know, in, I'm sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought, but there are Clifford Samak quotes all over the place in environmental circles. It's really funny. They have slipped out. It is clear that he was a person who was concerned about the planet as a whole mm -hmm. before even Earth Day was a thing, long before. And um, like I have this book that's called uh, The Guide for Environmental Quotations. And it has d different um, just quotes from everything from Henry David Thoreau, Rachel Carson. And there are consistently, there are several quotes in that book from Samak and Isaac Asimov, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the reasons why Samak caught on with me is that I was just at the beginning of my militant vegan phase when, when I started. Uh, and by phase, I, I, I still... <laughs> 27 years later, pretty much in the center of it. Um, so phase is probably a bad word, but I just when I was starting to get into being vegan uh, and being a radical environmentalist, I was reading some act. And so I kept dog earing pages and finding these quotes where he was putting little things in, especially um, ring around the sun uh, it is very thick on those things. And, uh, but this book is too. And uh, getting back to what I was trying to make a point about, and I got on a tangent as we do on this podcast often, is that um, uh, the prose is really well written in this book. Nobody could, could look at this and say that Samak wasn't a good writer. Uh, and there's definitely uh, beautiful moments. And, you know, I know. Uh, he, and it's evocative and, and very patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, he's not worried about making sure there's rocket ships or space battles or pew, pew, pew or any of that. It's just a very, you know, and that's why I think this book fits what I was talking about earlier about the Midwestern feel. This book is definitely very Midwestern. A lot of the parts where you're picturing Enoch in his cabin, you can almost, you know, hear the cicadas and, like, hear the, the night bugs and the, and the grass blowing in the wind and, and, and all that, even though um, he barely mentions those things. But you just, you got an evocative feeling of that kind of part of the world. At least for me as a Midwesterner reading this, I, I, I got it. But... Um, yeah, no, definitely, and, and that's kind of what I meant when I said I, I could see, I could see, hear, read the echoes of like uh, Western, you know, very picturesque, kind of pastoral, you know. But but that was that you know that was a specific ranch he was turning to make a point, you know. Yeah, let's uh, look at some of the um, more famous reviews of this book that I have. Um, there's a, a guy who's doing a similar series as ours for The Guardian named Sam Jordanson. He's re, he, he was blogging about all the different Hugo winners throughout. He's doing the whole gamut of Hugos, not just the 60s. But when he read this one, he said, 
Fortunately, this is one of those science fiction books where substance triumphs over style. Wave Station remains interesting in spite of its clunky plot and many passages of painfully wooden dialogue. I don't know if I'd agree with that, but... Partly it's attributable to the historical curiosity that all this of, of all that 1960s nuclear paranoia, but mostly it's because Samak's ideas are so sharp and his writing so warm. Intellectually, he makes great play of all the communication issues that Enoch must overcome to look over his way station. For instance, there's some tough philosophy about the human drive to violence and plenty of fun conceits like the threat of mankind, that mankind will be, quote, dumbed down by the Galactic Council. So that was Sam Jordanson of The Guardian. I'm not so sure I agree with the wooden dialogue thing. How did you feel about the dialogue, Matt? I mean, it, 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 to the degree that I can see how someone might say that, I, I didn't have that take on it. I mean, it, it didn't. You know, I mean, it, to me, it sort of played into the, it being old school, you know? Yeah, yeah. People talk differently, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, there's a website, portalist.com, that does um, reviews of, of portal narratives like Narnia and so on. And, and yes, Waystation is a portal novel. Uh, and they, this person said, oh, who is it? Betsy Mitchell is her name. Uh, I wasn't sure what to expect before reading, although I was aware that Waystation, published in 1963, has sold hundreds of thousands of copies in, my long, in its long lifetime. It's a slim little volume, only 236 pages in its print edition. It proves that a novel doesn't need twice as many words to contain worlds. Good point. It is also a very hope, hopeful story. I'm a sucker for a good post-apocalyptic read, but I was happily convinced to believe in a future that holds grand and glorious possibilities just awaiting our discovery. Such, sometimes such a future seems very far away from where we sit right now, watching nighttime news and grieving over atrocities being committed across the globe. Refreshingly optimistic viewpoint of the main character who has enormous challenges to face, essentially on his own, reminded me of The Martian by Andy Weir. So I hadn't really thought about how um, Enoch's alone in this. That that's a really good point, because um, it is a, an enormous. Well, we did talk about the enormous weight that he felt. So I guess we did talk about that a little bit. Well, and I mean, but one of the things that I took away. I mean, how how I'm in a, a place where I can get like semiotic and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, Enoch biblically, biblically was the father of Noah. And um, he, he was lifted up by God and made the boss of the angels and was given a new name and was called Metatron and became essentially the voice of God. And um, so in, in you know, Enoch Wallace, our character's case, it's like he sort of, it, it's like he became the railway clerk of God. <laughs> you know, I mean, that kind of wasn't lost on me. And, th and there's, I mean, there's some other stuff there too, but, and certainly he's almost a classic uh, hermetic character as well. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I mean, he's ascetic. Like he talks about his food, how simple what he eats is. You know, he's a monk, right? He's a monk. And at the end of it, with a sweet danger room, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Do him. <laughs> yeah, like the the one goose of of shoot 'em up sci fi that we get is yeah his uh, his target practice, and, and it's kind of you know if if we look at the way station as his brain, you know that's kind of a dream, you know within his brain or a nightmare as it, as it could be too. Um, and like it, it occurred to me that like all the artifacts that all the the presents that the travelers give to him that are stored in his basement, you know, those are memories. I mean, you know, he's got, he's got memories in his brain too. He's got a galactic museum in his basement in, yeah. in Wisconsin that is just chilling there that nobody knows about. Like that's kind of a cool concept to think about. 
So right. pr pretty sweet as well. So Enoch uh, has got a pretty cool layer going on there. So there was one other. There's a, one other blogger who I've referenced many times. Is Josh Wimmer from io9, who's blogging all the Hugo winners. And Josh said, I don't know. I think it must have been nice to be a science fiction writer at the time when Waste of Way Station was published. Time was still moving relatively slowly, though I'm sure it didn't feel that way. And you could just write a story without worrying that you hadn't addressed every single implication or repercussion of the cool ideas you came up with. Or I guess you don't have to worry about that now, but sometimes it feels like you do. That said, I think I like it better the way it is now. I don't ever regret having read a book, but I would recommend to you to run out and find this one. If humanity ever wants to be ready to join the, quote, co-fraternity of the stars, as Samak puts it so many times, then it's probably a good thing popular sci-fi graduated to more thoughtful and engaging level of storytelling. I liked that quote. And so we only have two things left, which is our rating and final review, and then uh, how we would adapt this for film. So let's start with how we would adapt this for film. So if, you know, Hollywood threw a bunch of money at you, Matt, uh, how would you adapt the story and would you change it much? What would you change? Or did I hit you with a question you weren't prepared for? Yeah, I wasn't really thinking in those terms, but I mean, I don't think I'd change very much. I mean, I think it would rest pretty heavily on the cinematography. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, because I'd want to get that sort of the macro micro factor and the you know brain in the way station and the body in the in the earth kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I'd do with you know Lucy being the only real girl. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's that, that's sort of a like you said earlier a, a, a classic problem with old sci-fi. But, I mean, you know, she's exalted. I mean, she's the Blessed Virgin, right? You know. Well, um, as anyone who listens to this show regularly knows, I always adapt these things into film in my head while I'm reading them. That's just kind of what I do. So I thought a lot about what I would do with Waystation, and I do think it could make a really cool movie. Um, the things I would... I, you could keep the budget low, um, I would, instead of Lucy being like some kind of made up simulacra, for one thing, I would make her a visitor. Who's well, no, Lucy's the Lucy's the the gal that can't talk. Oh, whoa, 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 wait, wait, right, you, you're right. Yeah, she's she's the one. She's the one that that you know makes us not the backwater universe. That she's the only real real girl. Right, right. <laughs> That's true. Sorry, sorry. I, I got confused a little bit. No, that's all right. Mary is the one. I would want um, his one of his friends and confidants to be a, a, a woman from another planet that visits him. Mm -hmm. So I would probably add another mm -hmm. one. But here's where I would mostly change the story, which is, first of all, I would set it. Um, I would set it in the early 60s still. And what I would actually do to give it kind of a ticking time bomb that doesn't exist in the book is I would set it um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, and which might seem kind of crazy, <laughs> right? No, I can see it. But have this parallel thing going on with the world being on the edge of nuclear annihilation, and Enoch at the same time facing this crisis where his his vegan corpse gets stolen from his yard and the Galactic Council wants to kick him out of his job of the way station and where well he's dealing with this idea of like I gotta get us into the co-fraternity of stars at the same time uh, the world is about to annihilate itself um, that's how I would how I would kind of update it and I think that would make a really great character film uh, and Another long-running joke in the in this show is that Anthony would cast every character in a film with Michael Shannon, and I would cast Guy Pearce in everything, 
But I don't know in this particular case if Guy Pierce is the right person to play like a Southern guy. But I like the idea because he's because he's from Oklahoma and he plays Southern people so well. Um, I would love to have Brad Pitt in this role, kind of make him a little uglier <laughs> than uh, he is sometimes. But um, but I would definitely want a Southern actor. So either Brad Pitt or a Walton Goggins, maybe. As Enoch, actually, Walton Goggins would be great. <laughs> in this role as Enoch. Um, so maybe Walton Goggins uh, or a Timothy Oliphant. Uh, I'd take any of those guys. Um, but uh, I, would I would actually love to see a character-based movie where the majority of the tension and di uh, comes from dialogue. And you could do it for a super low budget. You know? Because you're mostly you got to build the set of the way station and most of the action would happen in characterization and you wouldn't you do a period piece but you wouldn't have to build a lot of sets or anything like that so yeah i mean it's it's pretty sparse i mean it's you know yeah but heavy it's, heavy ideas and i think if you add the whole cuban missile thing then you'd you'd have much more of a ticking clock that yeah, would give, that. Give, give it a propulsive feel and for for ulysses i mean yeah he was pretty anthropomorphic i kind of had him looking like in my head, like a cross between like a gray alien, Venom, and and and, and Emmett Kelly. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's sort of how I saw him in my head. You know, like he was kind of creepy, but also kind of goofy, which is what you know. That's what he said. But so that kind of put those things together. Did you find yourself seeing some of this book in black and white? Because I kind of accidentally started seeing a lot of it in black and white in my head. Because I no, not at all, not at all. That's really interesting. Because just especially the first scene with Ulysses and Enoch, for whatever reason in my head, it was like it was almost like it was a Twilight Zone episode in my head. Sure. And kind of like when you get into the way station, it's like Wizard of Oz and everything's in color. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would actually make kind of an interesting way to tell the story, or to, to do the yeah. film in black and white as if it was a period. Or almost, I mean, to me, like the outside world, because he's got the river, you know, and it's it's like it's all it's all pretty lush, and uh, and 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 pretty, maybe a little sepia tone or something. Yeah, and for director, I have a director, and I've always, I've used him before because he's a director. I think he's one of the best directors. But Jeff Nichols, who directed um, Take Shelter, Mud and shotgun stories and what else has he directed recently loving and the absolutely amazing underrated midnight special um jeff nichols uh i think he's a fucking great director and i would love to see him direct a period piece of uh way station um but you know that's just my dream right and uh, but hey samac estate uh give me the rights i'll write a great script um <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm with it. That all sounds good. Yeah. All right. So for final thoughts, I'm gonna give um, I'm gonna give this book four out of five um, dead vegans in the backyard, um, uh, because it's it. Yes, um, some of the story the the storyline with the the spies and the government watching just kind of gets a really cool introduction in the beginning and gets dropped off and then comes back in but it looks like it's going to be the spine of the story and then it has very little to do with the story and then it becomes yeah. very unbelievable to the one thing that's super unbelievable for me is that Enoch would be like hey give me my alien corpse back right and they're just like sure sure we're here to help you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was, Oops. It was a bird. My bad. I took your alien corpse out of the yard. <laughs> I didn't realize it was going to set off a big thing. And sorry. <laughs> but but the guy, the government guy, the undercover government guy, was a ginseng hunter. That's true. That's how he. <laughs> that's how he first uh, discovered Enoch. He's like, hey, what's up with this weird dude? I'm like his cover. <laughs> Cover as the ginseng hunter, but I thought it was interesting that they call that he, Enoch referred to, you know, that guy and and the people doing that as watchers, 
which of course, you know, the fallen angels, but then it, it never played out. So I was frustrated with that. But All right. What's your final thoughts here, Matt, overall? I really enjoyed it. It, it was, it was deceptively simple and really kind of beautiful for that. Uh, so I, I don't think, had I read it back when we were first hanging out, I don't think I'd have liked it as much. I don't think I'd have liked it very much. I think I have a, a different, um, significantly different take on it now. I'm glad I didn't read it back then. You know, I, I did. I didn't read it initially because I knew like the premise, right? It was like, oh, this Civil War guy, and then he meets aliens, and I thought, well, that's Edgar Rice Burroughs. I don't want to, you know, why do I need to read that? <laughs> Right, it was way better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, way better. Um, yeah, significantly less racist too, um, <laughs> in many ways. On purpose, yeah. Yeah, then Burroughs definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. I overall, I liked it. Uh, I know I pointed out the things that I didn't like of it, but um, it's just part of my ongoing mission from Larry and Anthony to not uh, to be more critical. Um, <laughs> but I, overall, I, I dug the hell out of this. I don't think it's up there with my favorite Samac books, to be honest. Um, it seems like he, sh you know, and I guess retroactively he did win the Hugo for, for City, but, um, I think City is his masterpiece. Um, I could read City over and over. Um, I'm good with reading Waystation once. Unless I had, unless somebody was smartly gave me the job to adapt it into a film, then I would read it again. Yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah there were there were a couple of things because it was so simple. You know, that goes back to that three chord thing. Be, when it's so simple, you you can you can kind of screw it up pretty easy. <laughs> you know, and it's like the the talisman to save the universe that Lucy ends up being able to run. It, it, it should have been that little toy that she started spinning. You know, that's what I thought, but. But all those things aside, I mean, it was a very, a very beautiful piece in its in its thought, you know, in its thought process, and that's that's what it came down to. So. And and deserving of winning the Hugo, and I think this one is aged fine. I mean, you can tell that it's older, but there's nothing that makes you go hmm, except for you know, you know a little bit of the dialogue. You know? Yeah, the, the, and the lack of women is a little something, but it's not like. It's not like a third rail, you know, that's... Right, right. Yeah, no, th I mean, there were some pat conventions that made it a little, like... But you could kind of dismiss those as, eh, it's from a guy that started writing in the 30s, and it, and it's kind of, you know, falls into into the conventions, but not in a bad way. You know, the I think it, it won out, like, his his subtlety of conception won out over like the two dimensionality that some of the pieces brought to it, you know? Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, some, some act is, uh, um, you know, he, it's, it's sad that he doesn't have the notoriety that the, that an Asimov or a Heinlein had because his impact was obviously clearly important. It's, it's nothing else on Asimov. And Asimov having the effect that he did on, on the genre as a whole is really important. And um, also, Samak is less of a creep than um, Asimov apparently was. Uh, so, so you got that going on. Um, I recently did watch, you can on YouTube, there is, uh, Samak gave a, a, a speech at the 71 Hugos. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in the if you search on YouTube if you just uh, search Samac interviews the one of the few things that comes up is this um, uh, Hugo speech that he gave and it's really kind of cute to watch because it's definitely like the old guy like saying you know like you know hey science fiction is really neat and I'm still here and I still care about it <laughs> you know um <laughs> And it's definitely somebody who's coming to grips with the fact that the genre has moved on and there's a whole new wave and, and like, you know, and all that. But, hey, we've been talking for a long time about this really cool novel, so I think we should probably wrap things up. Uh, Matt, I think we're going to possibly see you back for some of the Trent Zelazny episodes because you're a Zelaznut, I think. 
Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That and Delaney, they really just, you know. Yeah, unfortunately, Delaney did not win in the 60s. So, um, but someday, um, I might want to, I mean, Dahlgren is just fucking great and um, <laughs> might deserve attention in this podcast eventually one day. I know I've been meaning to read Nova, so that's one that uh, I have not read that I want to read. By my, my favorite, I don't know if we've run out of time, but my favorite uh, Samuel Delaney, Roger Zelazny thing, mm-hmm. uh, Zelazny said, uh, you can't make something that has a title that, that's 11 words that's any good. And, and Delaney was like, oh, yeah, yeah, watch me, buddy. And uh, so I don't know if you're familiar with the short story, but it's um, we in some strange powers employ move on a rigorous line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's cool. Delaney's so, awesome and still with us. Yeah, he totally did it. Yeah. It, 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 it's a good story, too. <laughs> he is great. Um, you know, it's funny because we had talked about at one point I I was interested in doing Dahlgren because uh, – PKD hated Dolgram. <laughs> I was like, kind of surprised, but he like specifically complained about that book, uh, which was weird. And I have not found, I did try to find some quotes from PKD about Samak, and I did not find any. He was a, a, a Van Vogt guy uh, from that era and not mm-hmm. a Samak guy uh, from the 40s, 30s, 40s. So uh, there are no quotes from PKD on Samak, but. Um, so I don't know if he was a fan or not, but I'm assuming not because he definitely spoke a lot about the writers that influenced him. So, um, but yeah, uh, Matt, I really appreciate the time. Thanks for uh, bringing your insight into Waystation. And yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, and w- I wouldn't be the Samak reader that I was if in Karma Records you hadn't said, "Well, you really need to read Clifford Samak," because I was probably in there talking about Asimov and you know, like, "Hey, buddy, wow. read." Read this cool stuff, you know. Hey, it's, it's all about Sharon, and and still is. Yeah, um, I also got a lot of great music. Uh, for, you were the first person to ever tell me about Carcass. So that's, uh, yeah, big one. All right, <laughs> horns up. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, uh, <laughs> heads, keep it paranoid. Stay paranoid.